What do you mean removed? Jordan. Jordan was given that data. Yeah. He's removed. Ah, removed. I heard removed. He's removed. John Bush, I talked to them. That you want something like they have five years for a job of schema that the whole thing, you have no issue. Yeah. So, Jordan kind of talks uh, is taking polishing up the, the last uh, editorial stuff mostly and the stuff that the uh, guy can, uh, the guy can read, uh, the one of the comments like, can we uh, so it's a distributed system, which one is the same on my phone? No, 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 Yeah, well, I don't know if you are. This guy's talking to you, but not asking. I don't know, this guy's pretty useful. Like, stick a bit. I already told you. With a big smile, I see him, right? And he immediately forgot all about it. Yeah. But he just started to look for someone to do it for him. We're good. We love Jeff. We should have stickers. We love Jeff or something. I told Jeff. There's only three documents on my cube right now. All three are written. So what's come on? You're behind. Yeah, so let's close the door. Jeff was at the hand of I've seen him in the room go off the room never again. But he was because the fish moved before the room. In the competition. And I advised you how to copy things. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Rift at IDF 118. It's great to see everybody. We had a very successful hackathon. We got Juniper to talk to ZT implementation, full success. So, session is open. Jeffrey and myself. Uh, you should know by now, not well, if you haven't read it. It defines how you contribute to ATF, that everything you contribute to ATF is in accordance to ATF rules. Please be familiar with all the BCPs and RFCs. Uh, please do sign in. That helps us to get a room next time. And if you want to ask a question, please get in queue on your application. And uh, if someone could help us with taking the notes, would be highly appreciated. Thank you. So agenda for today, we will talk and then uh, Jordan will update us remotely on base spec and KV registry. So on base spec, <coughs> I think we are pretty much ready for ISG. So Jim did really great work getting all the things together. So very soon, with me to ten. Thanks again, Jordan, Tony, for addressing all the comments. Really good work. Uh, so Tony will update us on the hackathon results, how that's been. And then the rest of the time, we are dedicated to Rift in Dragonfly. And this is the agenda for today. Yeah, it's there. We had a private discussion with the Service 6 folks. So there is a progressing SRM PLS and Rift draft. So we pointed out that it used a particular way to distribute seats. So they're going to take a look and align with the SRM PLS. Uh, Jordan. Yeah, can you guys hear me OK? Yes, great. All right. OK, Jeffrey, are you driving the slides? Yeah, OK. Okay, we can get to the next one. Okay, uh, so what's new in 19? A um, little bit of new stuff. This is mostly to support the new key value uh, target or, or the new key target stuff that we'll be describing in the next slide deck, uh, but it needed a little bit of a schema update as a result. And as part of that, we bumped the entire schema to version seven. So um, mostly for right now, administrative, unless you're doing interop. A uh, couple normative changes. 
not not really changes in terms of actual behavior, just clarifications, really. Um, so basically that if we do any state transitions to where no action is specified, we must consider it something that's unrecoverable and we have to reset all state. Uh, again, previous text basically implied that, but we're just making it normative here. Uh, and similarly, uh, if, you know, if we have a link in three way for, you know, V4 and or V6, and it wants to stop supporting one of the address families, we have to tear down the entire session uh, and, and remove any state. Um, okay, next, next slide. So security considerations, there's been a bit of discussion about, you know, how to document this a bit. Uh, Alvaro brought some up, so did Jim. So this is kind of the culmination of that. Basically there's been the uh, little, little bit of a, Polite way to put its discussion uh, about you know one versus two fifty five for TTL and hop limit, um, and basically what we've converged on is you know if we're using two fifty five or if an implementation chooses to use two fifty five, RFC fifty eighty two covers that. Um, we mentioned that might still be some misprocessing or forwarding loops or loops in the forwarding plane things like that, and if we're using one, you know multi hop spoofing is still possible, but it's extremely hard to engineer some of those uh, attacks. Uh, and replays are also possible, but we're already kind of covered by all that. Uh, security envelope, other considerations in there. Um, uh, let's see, beyond that, editorial stuff. Um, thanks to Jim for the comments, just kind of clarified some things that were difficult to parse and kind of converged on common language, you know, TOF versus top of fabric. Um, my reference updates, things like that. Next slide. Yeah, so, you know, st still kind of going through, I guess what I'd call AD review. Um, you know, Jim's basically given the nod that he's done. And I think the goal here uh, is that the other two routing ADs will complete their review before we go to IETF last call. Uh, yeah, so that's it for the base spec, pretty straightforward. Questions, concerns. I see Jim. Hey Jordan, uh, th thanks for that, and thanks for taking care of all of that uh, for me. So um, very much appreciated. The only the only comment I had was the the TTL thing. Um, you're going to put some text in the applicability document on that, right? Is that something that you're doing? Because I kind of want to try and get that moved at the same time. Um, so if we can kill two birds with one stone, that would be great. Yeah, I, I've I've been driving the discussion a bit. Um, got gotten some discussion, but I uh, think think we're at the point where I'll just I'll just write some text and uh, propose it. You know, ask for forgiveness rather than permission, so to speak. Yeah, um, just to make sure we're covered. But yeah, and, and then there were a, there were a couple other points in the applicability side, but nothing. Um, nothing that relates to any, something that's normative like this. So Yeah, so that, that one's pretty much done as well, right? So I'm hoping uh, we can... Uh, Minor we stuff, can, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, perfect, thanks. No problem. Okay, uh, KV registry gets a little bit, gets, gets some interesting work here. So next slide. Okay, so uh, as Jeff mentioned, there was some discussion in San Francisco about you know how to distribute uh, targeted information to nodes or sets of nodes, uh, you know, with, with KV ties, and you know, basically we've been kind of at the mercy of you know southbound flooding, and you know, get too many leaves, it becomes too problematic. So I uh, came up with the concept of key targets, where basically we can optionally identify groups of, uh, of nodes that are intended to receive a specific KV tie. So we basically do this by using, you know, a 64-bit Bloom filter. Um, and we've also defined a hashing algorithm for deriving the key target values in the draft as well. Um, it's completely optional, fully backwards compatible, um, you know, it, whether an implement implementation supports it or not, or someone wants to turn it on, it's, you know, uh, d default is to flood KVs as, as it, you know, is, uh, you know, effectively today. Uh, next slide. K 
Okay, so how do they work? Uh, basically, you know, like I said, Bloom filters, but we have two values that we hold. So all zeros is flood to everything, and all ones is flood to all leaf nodes. Um, you know, any of the other values, you know, kind of a subset of the fabric will be derived using that normative hashing algorithm. Uh, it really only makes sense to process these on, on South KV ties. Um, you know, the northbound LSDB still needs to maintain a full view of everything southbound. Um, so basically, you, you know, key target must not right be present on northbound KB ties at all, uh, and you know, any any southbound reorigination, you know, as we go through the levels, uh, must, you know, the key target must be preserved as well. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so this kind of brings in you know at least one interesting problem that we've seen uh, basically with purging and rollover, right? So there are you know several scenarios where you know a a node might select a new KV tie, you know whether it's the sequence number incrementing, uh, you know change in the original tie breaking result, or if we lost the adjacency to the northbound neighbor that was holding the the previously selected KV tie, so makes for pretty interesting considerations when nodes are no longer included in the given key target or, or, or group of nodes. And, you know, leaf nodes come to mind here. They can, if you've got ZTP running, they can not be leaves anymore if you miscable something or um, something of that nature. Next slide. So basically, you know, consider this case where you have, you know, key target one and it covers nodes one, two, and three. Uh, and they all want, you know, KV tie one in their LSDB. If node two stops being a part of key target one, uh, if, and we need to update that KV tie to a new instance, uh, node two will be stuck with that older instance until the lifetime expires, which can be a very long time. And if you have lots of KV ties and lots of nodes, that's, well, it's suboptimal to say the least. Um, next slide. Uh, so, so basically, you know, we say, you know, I'll, I'll let you read the text, but effectively we have to, you know, maintain groups. Uh, we basically will say that, you know, we need to flood an instance of the new KV tie to the, uh, to the old key target so that it can, you know, with, with a short lifetime so it can appropriately, you know, purge state. Um, that's, that will ultimately be implementation specific. It's up to you how to do it, but, you know, that's, that's how we're looking at doing this. Um, yeah, next slide. I think that's it. No, no, okay. So, yeah, what's next? Um, any comments or questions related to key targets? Obviously, welcome. And um, beyond that, kind of housekeeping, right? Uh, Ayanna has mentioned to me uh, basically, we just need to be a little bit more explicit in terms of how we, um, you know, define register values as, you know, available or not. Um, it's, you know, easy stuff. Uh, and then, you know, the, Everything below that line is copy paste from last time. We're basically waiting on the RIP step. So once uh, once ADs get through the rest of this, we get to ITF last call, then the, the KV registry doc should go qu through quite quickly. Uh, that's it. Any any questions? Um, I have a question. Um, so. I had thought that this document is about the registry itself. Um, it seems that now we have uh, added, uh, added this uh, mechanism for the key targets and then it's handling all those things. Um, so should the draft be renamed and then title changed? That's probably not an awful idea. Um, I think Tony's gonna mention it, but we, we've had other mechanisms described there as well besides key targets like the southbound tie breaking and so forth, but go ahead, Tony. Uh, well, the only thing that is the change in the RIF document is that, so first uh, we thought that we basically have the um, uh, key, which was always outside and then the content, it was just a blob. And we wanted to throw the target into this blob, but we decided that we basically split it into key, uh, sorry, the key, and the target, and then the blob, which is the really the value, right? So, so that schema change, so we have to register this code point for the content for the key value tie. But in terms of what this thing does, the Rift spec doesn't say anything. That's all still farmed out to the key value spec. 
Right. So the the spec is really not only about the registry, but also about the behavior. Right. The, so that's the, the Rift spec. Uh, no, that that that's KV at KV registry spec. This particular document that we uh, were talking about, KV registry. Right. Document. So it also specified the behavior of this field. So since we defined the tie breaking of the uh, of the key value store on the Rift spec, you could argue that we should put the target text also into the Rift spec. No, no, that's what I'm, that's not Yeah, so, so your point is? My point is that this document, uh, KV registry document, is not only about ah, yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it defines also the target behavior. Mm -hmm. yes. Right, so I think that the document should be renamed and, and just to be... Fair enough, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that for next time, Jeffrey. That's fine. Since it's just a title change, it's not a big deal. Uh, Sunny ZTE, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, uh, in some scenarios, may I understand the key target is the routing target in MPBGP? If it can be used like this? No? <laughs> yes, no, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So Tony P again, Juniper. So people are probably confused because I'm not sure everybody knows how a bloom filter works. So the idea is fairly simple. You take something fairly big and then you generate multiple hash functions of something. And you get, let's say, three hash functions, three bits, and you flip those three bits on. And that way you can put 100,000 targets into 64 bit. Okay, of course you will get false positives but you don't get false negatives. So you may address more people than you intend, but you have a very small filter, all right? Whereas the route target in BGP is like you have by policy, you have a perfect match here, don't have a perfect match. You have something which statistically works actually incredibly well, all right? But it delivers false positives and you have to deal with that. It's a well-known thing, read the research papers, blah, 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 often used technique, but the equivalence of the route target breaks down here because it's not the perfect match, right? It's like you look, you look you in the eyes. Um, all right, so uh, we suffered through the hackathon for two days, you know, way too much food. It was really hard. Uh, <laughs> um, so ZT have shown up uh, with uh, very serious implementation, um, uh, module like negative disaggregation key value seemed everything in place. Uh, Bruno's code is, of course, you know, being pulled up. And Juniper was there. And Chaba has some stuff. He promised that he will give us something next month. So he had some leaf implementation that he already tested, but then he was in the beer interrupt. So guess what? You know, he didn't have time for uh, to show up and participate in both. Um, okay. Uh, so that's I only show because it's a beautiful picture. You know what the rift is, right? So we had like 10 something people hanging around there. I think. Two people do the, did the real work, <laughs> okay? Um, and uh, we did uh, interrupt tests in different part of specification. Um, yeah, the stuff jumps five or nothing. No, this stuff doesn't work. All right, so, so I pulled up Bruno's code. Bruno is traveling the world again. So I pulled up his uh, code to on the AWS for um, Changes in the newest spec, basically, you know, the usual just compile the thrift schema, throw it in there and add one or two fields uh, and run it against our stuff. And that passed all fine. No surprises. Um, and then uh, we threw together stuff with uh, ZT because ZT doesn't have a virtual version yet. Uh, so there was some, you know, physical remote boxes and so on and so on. Uh, our stuff was thrown on a Docker container and there were uh, basically it was just one interesting discussion um, when you have one part one side of the adjacency configure v4 v6 and the other one only v6 right uh, though 
there was a misunderstanding that because the V4 doesn't show up, you don't bring up adjacency. But in fact, the FSMs in the spec is precise enough. Um, so, you know, the, the V4 will start stay in one way and the V6 will build up a three way. So that, uh, that was one output where it discussed through. Then uh, uh, we added some internal prefix announcements to ZT and uh, we were seeing the disaggregation. Uh, yeah, the full flooding was going on. So the full exchange was working. That was all fine. And we were limited because um, Normally, uh, we run our images on Katara, which is this thing over the top of the Docker doing some magic. And that was a naked Docker config. And um, some Linux version have this very ugly bug um, where you open a multicast socket register for multicast address. And if the same multicast destination comes towards you from two different interfaces, they will deliver only one copy from one interface. It's, it's, it's a known bug, but it was pretty much unfixable. So we were basically running Juniper always on one interface against ZT. And then we discussed a lot of this Dragonfly stuff. It was interesting because that clarified that my Dragonfly draft, which was slapped together very quickly, <coughs> was not that clear as I thought. And like I said, Chaba was um, busy with beer, so he did nothing. He said promised something maybe in a month or two to publish something to the list. So... The bad things was the hackathon ran out of t-shirts because, you know, grafters like <laughs> Jeff were there before the real people showed up. The food was good too much. <laughs> the Rift spec held up, so we had basically no changes on the spec. And the testing on hardware box is damn tedious, but everybody knows that. So that's kind of what came out of it. Questions, observations, Rotten Tomatoes? No, nothing. No questions. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Next one is you again. Yes. Now, okay. So, so this one will be entertaining. It's probably what you came for. Uh, um, so you've seen the Dimas presentation about this BGP thingy and a million VPNs and you know whatever unnatural thing, which is kind of natural thing for BGP has to be done. And uh, we ended up having some discussions with Jeff and Dima about you know what how could, could you do it on Rift? And I was pushed to do it for Rift as well internally. I don't know. Uh, uh, Dragonfly seems to be current, you know, like the hype thingy. Um, so I went and thought the stuff through, and those gentlemen did no work, so it's basically all my stuff. But some key ideas are demons, actually, in the whole thing to make it work. Fine. So it starts basically with the fact that if I started to look at precise research on sparse dragonfly, nobody defined what the hell is a sparse dragonfly. So I had to think through what is actually a sparse dragonfly. Um, so now imagine that you have, so originally Dragonfly was basically full meshes hooked up to a central full mesh, okay? And the central full mesh is just too full, so you start to thin it out. That's why it's called kind of sparse Dragonfly, right? And this Dragonfly Plus seems that instead of running full meshes as wings, you run clone networks, all good. So what sparse Dragonfly is, is if, if, you, if you look at the stuff here, right, it's what, it's eight edges. Um, instead of building a complete full mesh between eight, you can see it in different ways. So you can consider it as two planes, the red plane, the red plane and the green plane, which are kind of disjoint, right? Um, or you can consider the thing as a half full mesh. That's the other way to view the thing. You just thin out half the full mesh. And we talk about properties it gives and so on. So the way you construct this thing is you start from a red guy and then you basically connect every second guy, right? So you skip always one guy and this could basically half, all right? And the important thing is in the whole thing is that every red node can reach every other red node in two hubs. That's the trick property here. And every green node can reach another green node in two hubs. But now you can, so because you have two planes, now you can also see it basically as something, you know, that's why I did the squares, where you have these 
multi plane attachment to this backbone where you get two planes. And this is, for example, actually quite interesting discussion also for people who build something like multi plane uh, IGP backbones today, right? That this is actually a, a nice way to visualize it because normally people just visualize these two, two backbones and the hookup routers and so on and so on. This is kind of a very regular way to do that. And you see on these arrows, right, if this guy goes to the other side, he has actually three paths. One path goes one hop, and the other one goes two hop. And of course, there's like four or five hop paths and so on, but disregard those. I mean, you can run Hamiltonian graphs. But the important thing is the direct and the one indirect next hop, because that is the property that they are looking for in the Dragonfly, that your bisexual bandwidth is not just a direct link, but you have actually, you can saturate the stuff, you know, throughout the path. So it gives you much more bisectional bandwidth than actually direct link. All right, so that's kind of the layout. Now, Tony, yeah. do you want to take the questions now or later? Um, it's a clarification about this diagram. So. Sure, should, yeah, should. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, it's, a, it's, it's tons of information, we get worse. <laughs> Hi, this is Rod, Rod Van Meter Hi, from KR University. So um, this diagram, you said eight links, but I think there's- No, no, there's eight, eight edges. Eight edges. Eight edges. Yeah, okay. it's an eight, whatever, octogram. An what octogram, you call this yeah. Thing. Uh -huh. so it's and an there's, no, there's no node in the middle. No, right? no, no, no. This is an octogram. So it's a regular okay. thing, right? So, so the Dragonfly original is just like full mesh and these little wings, which are all full meshes. Okay. And you have four of them and you align it correctly. It looks like a Dragonfly, kind of. Okay. And the box, the boxes on, on the right edge so and the bottom edge are- The thing about this, those are the whatever routers. Okay. Right? And they built an octo. And those are the two planes, how they connect that. And yes, I should have probably made big blobs, but that was too late. And there would be two more of these on the top and the left or? or, or well, the thing behind it doesn't matter because those are claw planes, really. Okay. So those are claw fabrics on the Dragonfly Plus, as okay. far as I could figure out, because there's really yeah. no clean paper that will explain yeah. to you in the research terms what the hell it is. I've, se I've seen sort of a moderate amount of these interconnects, but I've never seen the Dragonfly Plus. This one's new to me. Okay. Yeah. So, so that was as much as I could reconstruct from all kinds of ideas flying around. Yeah. Okay. So Linda, um, so I'm a little confused about this picture too. Um, so you're saying the red nodes, um, there are no red nodes. It's just a red plane. Red plane. Uh, yeah. You can talk. No. So those would be the red nodes. Those three, four guys. But, but you have a box connecting the green and so the red. Does that mean it's just one it node? It's an important concept. Right. So you can see it in different ways. You can see there's two completely disconnected planes. Right? Mm -hmm. You can see this half a full mesh, or you can see these two planes that you can somehow connect together, right? You keep those links. Okay, so I see the red plane is only one hop away from each node. Why do you see this? No, hops? think about these are two nodes together. Look, there's a middle one, the, the red one goes through there too. Isn't that one hop? Uh, there is no node here. No, no, no. There's a red connection from in the Crossbar is that one line, one half? So forget the crossbar. There's no crossbar. That's just the base the driven fly class backbone. That's the only thing we look at. But like what two. do we have in the middle? Of this crossbar? nothing. Nothing. It's just random. If you start to draw things like that, the things intersect. So yeah, my bad. Only those things are nodes. It's an octogram. Oh, okay. So the, the middle one is not really the connection. There's nothing there. It's just random That's because just... lines intersect. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, try to paint with Microsoft PowerPoint. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, there is there's no node. There's four red links. There's, well, there is six red links, in fact. Six, well, count them. Ones you so one, two, three, four, five, six. So the six one there. There is no node in the middle. There's nothing there. Then there's one half away between those two. Which two? No. If you go from here to here, yeah. you're either one hop away, but you have two connections with a two hop away. It will be very important. So you have got shortest path and non shortest path link. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you have one hop and you have some two hop links, <laughs> and that's very important. That. Yeah. Hop, yeah, yeah, correct. Oh, yeah, so this I is the one point. hop, this arrow, and those signify two hop links. Right. Because it's very important. That's one of these big properties of this thing that they have you bisectional bandwidth. You can actually have much more bisectional bandwidth than just direct links. Okay, but nobody talked about routing on those things ever. Like, yeah, you know. I think that's your last bullet point that causes confusion for me. It kind of assumed, the way I read that was like, ah, yeah. two hops. Yeah. Yes, right. and oh, in okay. one hop. Yes, sorry. That's oh, implicit. That's okay, cool. Yes, so fine. Because that's kind of, uh, 
it's like a multidimensional way you can look at the whole thing. And that's where you start. Now we start to do homomorphisms on a claw. You have to be fairly uh, quick on your feet. Okay. So now I looked at this thing, and this is a very simple dragonfly. Just with, so, so now we talk dragonfly plus. That will be one with like three fabrics, right? And now we, you see there's two triangles are the two planes. It's a simple example just to not over, overload with pictures. So if you now say, okay, we have these claw fabrics and we have the whole thing connected with the, with the sparse dragonfly, that's what the picture looks like. And my, the first idea is, okay, let's make a homomorphism on one single claw. And if you do that, you end up with the stuff below. This disregard the fabric A and fabric B for the moment. It's just one fabric. And if you start to draw the dragonfly plus on a single fabric, you end up with something like that, which looks like a kind of a multi-plane fabric, which is miscabled. What do I mean by that, right? So you would say, this is one plane, this is a second plane. So all looks good, right? But stuff gets confusing because if this guy is connected to this plane, he should be also connected to those guys to be also in this plane. Or rather, if he's in this plane, he should be on SA1, SA2B1 as well. But this link is superfluous because he should be in one plane on the multi-plane claw. And the point is that the whole thing does not work very well. You could hook up rift and run it like that, you end up with tons of disaggregation because there's tons of links missing. So it's really the homomorphism from this setup onto a single claw fabric does not work particularly well. And no matter what protocol you run, it's just cabled all the way wrong to an extent, right? So Rift would work, but it will work, no, quite, you know, uh, in the non-impressive way. So when I started to think about the whole thing, I started to think that that's a more complicated picture. Now you really have multi-plane fabrics, two-plane fabrics, probably cabled, hook up to this uh, sparse Dragonfly Plus backbone. I know there's a lot of homomorphies now. That's why this first picture was so important, right? You have to think about all these things at the same time. It's a multi-plane thing, but it's not a claw, it's a whatever, it's a half-connected thing. And now we split all those fabric as separate rift fabrics, which also seems more natural because all I gather is like these dragonfly guys are interested in the thing because it's a very natural way to interconnect DCs. Okay. So now you're basically interconnecting three DCs if you want to think about it that way, right? Multiplane DCs, and in between you have those two planes, which I show you a nice complicated picture at the end. But those are basically a sparse dragonfly in the middle, right? Plus some links, but that's not important for the moment. So now, what happens now is something interesting. So you have an intrafabric horizon and an interfabric horizon. And that will be very, very important for the bisectional bandwidth, right? So the links in the middle are kind of a different horizon. Uh, and I tell you what it means later. Uh, so now we have to change procedures because those links are kind of funky, right? Before, in the fabric, the TOF had either horizontal links to other TOFs or south and nothing else. And now these guys are kind of northbound. Okay, so what do we do with that? To make that work, now a couple of procedures change. So when we hello, now we have to differentiate between Southbound links, that's easy, right? Those guys are not TOFs. Because observe, now all these six guys are TOFs, top of fabrics. And that's, that's important now. So normally the TOFs would allow only southbound link or they would have a horizontal link to the, to the guy, the same guy in the same fab fabric. Now, we have somehow to be able to tell the difference whether the SA1, SA2 link is a horizontal link in the same fabric or whether it's an SA1 to SB1, which is an interfabric horizon link. And the way we do that is that first we put a, on the top a flag saying, I support Dragonfly Plus. Okay. The moment to support Dragonfly Plus, you must have a unique fabric ID. So all these guys get different fabric IDs, right? Whatever. Think about A, B, C. 
And each of them on top is configured as Dragonfly plus capable. And now the distinction becomes actually quite, uh, quite easy. If, you, if, if um, you talk to another TOF and he's also doing Dragonfly, but his fabric is different, it's actually interfabric horizon between fabrics, right? If you have TOF and both are Dragonfly capable, but it's the same fabric ID, it means you're horizontally in the same fabric. If both are TOF, but one is not Dragonfly capable, you miss cabled. You can't run a wild mixture of those things. And if one is not TOF, then just normal rules apply. It means southbound. And that way you can now separate on a TOF relatively easy the interfabric horizon from the intrafabric horizon from the horizontal links within the fabric. Okay. So now comes the interesting part. How do we change uh, computation? So to simplify things for the negative disaggregation, we can basically drop out the interfabric links. We do not want to disaggregate negatively when things fall in other fabrics. It's a simplification because you could do that. You have all this information. The beauty is that there's no change in flooding whatsoever. All these guys, as you know, horizontal link TOFs basically flood northbound. So all these guys will take all the topology, shove into the other guys, shove into other guys. So all of these TOFs will basically see the full topology. That's the nature of Rift. And that's the price to pay for this thing to work well. Just at the very top, right? So to simplify things, we discard into fabric link from all the negative and positive disaggregation. But you can do this computation. It just gets, we talk about how to do that. It will just get a lot of computation. So it's optional, you can do that. And then the first thing we're building direct interfabric routes. So basically one hop interfabric routes. Now comes exactly this bisection discussion, right? So basically it's not, it's not particularly difficult. When we do computation, I will use the picture again. We basically force first, an in, we go through an interfabric link and then we on another fabric and then we just no, run the normal computation. And that will give us all the destinations, the other fabrics where we can get in a single hop. Okay, so that's cool. But now we add to it, this thing is tedious. Um, indirect interfabric routes. And think that that's the fabrics you can reach in two hops. And you modify the computation by basically taking two interfabric links away, and then from there start to compute. It's important you differentiate between those two. That's kind of Dimas big insight that helped me, right? So you have this, I can get to the other fabric one hop away, I can get two hops away. But now comes the interesting thing with the forwarding. If you forward along the one hop, well, the, st the stuff will not loop because the fabric will grab it and just forward it forward. But now think what will happen if you just start to forward along the two hops. You throw it to another fabric, he says, that's not my destination. He can just throw it back to you because you look like a two hop away. So to visualize that, right? Now, SA1 has the brilliant idea to, to go to SC1. He can use bisectional two hops, so he goes to SB1. So SB1 sees on the IP packet SC1 destination. It goes like, I'm playing the bisectional game too. And by the way, SA1 is the bisection to SC1. And you just build the loop. All right? So here comes the big trick. When the packet arrives from the fabric-sided interface from south, uh, you can use both, the one hop and the two hop route, because you're good. But if the packet arrives from the interfabric horizon, that's where this concept of this horizon is important, you can only use the direct. All right, so to, ex to give you the example. So LA11 pushes a fabric towards fabric C. It arrives at SA1. It sees that it came from an interface which is southbound, okay? and says, okay, I can use the FIP that has one and two hops. And he throws it at SB1. The SB1 sees that it's coming from the interfabric horizon. And at this point in time, it can only use the direct FIP. So it goes to SC1. And now I flip back and it, this picture starts to make sense. Now you understand while everything has, there must be a one hop route and a two hop route. okay? And that way you get the bisectional bandwidth, which includes the single hop and 
dual hop, okay, by, by running the horizon. And it's actually nothing special. Basically, all the silicon supports it because that's exactly how VPN works, right? You have to understand from, of, based on the incoming interface which FIP to use. So it basically, the silicon is already there. Instead of running VPNs, we basically use that on, you know, interface-specific FIP and split the horizon. And that's about the whole magic, if you didn't get lost yet. Um, uh, so the interesting observation is, of course, that now for multiplane to work well, we were always talking that the TOFs right here, two planes, each the, 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 uh, the claw has to be ringed at top, right? And the funny thing is that basically, if you look at this picture, it falls out by itself. If you think about these entry points, these squares at two plane fabrics, that's why I put these squares around. Now your picture goes towards, those are four multi-plane claw fabrics stitched together, okay? And if you look at the, at the links that are normally included in the, in the Dragonfly Plus even, right? Then you will see that you just leave these links between the fabrics that go like this between the planes out, but the planes are already ringed. And if you want to be extra conformant, then you add another link to not only just have a link between the plane, but have a ring. Rift will also work with just a single chain, but then basically you are bound by a single failure, right? Flooding breaks. If you have a ring, you need two failures for the for the flooding to break. Okay. Um, so we have the, the the ringing. There's no far uh, further changes needed. Okay. So if we build it like that, the negative disaggregation does not propagate across the fabrics. And if we keep the interfabric links in the negative disaggregation, positive disaggregation, it will work. But now you have to run those computations from the point of view of all the TOFs, of all the fabrics to do the job correctly. And that will have scale limitation, right? You have three fabrics, maybe good. If you have 20 or 30 fabrics, yet you start to compute, you know, 300, 400 of those computations, depends how much juice you have. Right? Then you have to ask yourself, okay, how likely is it that the whole thing, you know, the breakages in one fabric are only fixable by the other fabric going all the way back to the leaves and doing the correct thing? It becomes more and more and more and more un unlikely. Um, so that is the gotcha, right? But it's under discussion. We can, you know, it's also, in a sense, each implementation can do what they want. The more computation they implement, the better they will work on the failures. And I leave you with this. Okay, so that would be six fabrics with two planes, right? The blue and the yellow planes. That's what it will look like for six fabrics. And uh, this little thingy up there, I've shown like if you really do a ring, right? Because normally it's just this. If you look at proper Dragonfly Plus or, or Sparse Dragonfly. So if we really want to ring those two tops at the top, like Rift recommends, then you do a little ring. And... I'm sure you can somehow figure out how to make a Lisa Zhu uh, figure out of that. If you don't know what Lisa Zhu figures are, go look it up on the web. Okay. <laughs> because they have yet another different you know, aspect of beauty to them. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. So um, all the stuff is fleshed out. Uh, you know, if anybody feels like writing, you know, that, that very tediously all these algorithm normative stuff and so on, then be welcome. But I think the magic is kind of figured out. Fantastic, we have some profs here. I think this is you know, a beautiful mental exercise to go and you know, figure out whether the whole structure holds together. Um, because I slept it together myself, you know, and implementation, there was no time for anything like that. Okay. So I'll bring a couple of points and we can start discussion. So why is this important? People have been trying Dragonfly, like topologies, in data center to save on interfaces practically the complexity doesn't justify the deployment. Where it becomes really interesting is when you use interlink links to interconnect data center, as Tony said. And there's a very important point. Today, it's pretty much impossible to get data center over 50 megawatt. There's just no power to cool it and power it. 
So a lot of people started building data centers in the US in pairs of 50, 60 megawatt data centers. It just naturally lays down to this kind of topology. So you've got twice 50 megawatt data center, and then within data center, you run your whatever you like, right? Most probably GPUs. So that's number one. This is why this is so important. Number two, this provides you loop free routing. It doesn't explain how to get traffic on the links. But practically, the cheapest way is to go on the shortest link. It also gives you lowest latency. You want to be able to use longer links, but you need to understand that in, again, looking, the target for this really machine learning clusters. In collective operations, you cannot afford to have part of collective operations having different latency because it's all about job completion time, right? So you need to make sure that whatever your GPU is running it is following the same path. How do you get traffic in case congestion on another link? Again, another problem to solve, not here, but practically you need to know when to switch from shortest path to non-shortest path. And it's not in routing protocol, at least as of now. Uh, adaptive routing applicability here. Again, if you try to do more granular load balances in just per flow, you end up in a case where some of your packets go on the shortest link, some don't. Performance goes to 3%, right? So it's really important to understand from applicability perspective, how to deploy it, how to signal potential congestion or bandwidth available or failure on the inter-fabric links. And all of this will need to be worked out, at least some of it. So and this is where I think we should start discussion. I see Dima already in, in the queue. Yeah, but you know uh, the, the nice thing if you if you start to look also this you know direct path and this one alternative hop, this is an incredibly resilient structure. I mean you have to to ki kill tons of connectivity before this thing literally starts to be become unreachable. When I was looking at the stuff, and you know if you build like three planes, claw, um, and then this thing in between, I mean you you have to nuke it before the stuff starts to actually not have any path to get anywhere. Because I kind of hated Dragonfly. I thought it was too dense and nobody could figure out the routing. Now I start to like them. Of course, because I think I figured them out. <laughs> yeah, all right. So I think that's it. So uh, discussion, Dima. Uh, um, more questions, whatever, yeah. Uh, one more comment. There's a draft that's processing a routing working group that focuses actually on BGP in Dragonfly Plus. If you want to get Kind of terms you're more familiar with VRFs, BGP policies. It explains how this can be done with BGP policies, where rather understanding whether a link comes from the fabric or from the interlink, you just use different VRFs and you count really ISS and AS pass to figure out where you are. So it will help you to better understand applicability of regular routing protocol to this. And Dima, your question. We cannot hear you. Mm -hmm. Whereas, I mean, here without saying, I didn't even mention it, all the ZTP stuff works as usual, right? So I didn't touch any of those procedures. This will be uh, you are mute, I think. Mm -hmm. Wiggling your eyebrows doesn't tell hey. us much. Hey, yeah. hey. Ah, good, good. So, yes, thanks, Tony. It's, uh, it's really impressive uh, what you did with Rift and... Um, I just wanted to comment about uh, computation scalability problem because, well, essentially, if we are trying to use uh, silicon to the maximum, then number of groups probably will be uh, half the radix of uh, top of public switches, uh, plus one. Because we have half interfaces going south, half interfaces going north, and they are going to other groups, and plus one is our local group. So it could be 33, 65 for current generation of silicon and something like that. But uh, I think there's no need to do full computations for every group because the reason to do full computation if you are going to uh, go through intermediate group and going to reflect wire leaves in that group. No, no the only reason to do the full computations I mentioned is if you really want the negative disaggregation, positive disaggregation, tackle the, the, the cases where 
you have to start in the fabric on the direct plane because you can only get on this plane to the other fabric, to the leaf. Okay, so, so it's in, in the cases where other fabric breaks and it forces all the way to your fabric to disaggregate. You, you, yeah, you yeah, see yeah, my yeah. point, right? I mean, those are like, yes. I don't even know how many links have to break and how. Uh, but yeah, this the is point the is, only reason to run the comp computations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, point is that probably it's possible to do less computations than like full computation for every member fabric. Uh, because, uh, yeah, that's yeah, what I wrote, right? I said, like, leave out the interfabric link when you do positive and negative disaggregation. It's good enough, most likely. Yeah, yeah, because negative disaggregation is needed if you cannot go through particular top of the fabric switch. Yeah. Totally right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to, like, second what Jeff said, that uh, there is this, uh, like, power scalability problem for how much you can get for one particular data center, but topo this topology looks like a good fit for data center campuses or any agglomeration of data centers which are not too far from each other. And you want to have more or less uniform connectivity and a lot of bandwidth between them because it's, it scales better than trying to add uh, yet another level to, to the claw. Right. So if anybody feels like a little bit of mental exercises, especially the profs here, now imagine you run this thing on an optical ring, counter-rotating. What will happen if the ring get cut in one place? What will, what will this topology look like and what will happen? Because this next layer of, pro of problem in Metro, right? Because you run this whole thing on lambdas over a ring. Yeah, so that's it for me. Thanks. Um, well, thank you. Next question. I, I'm Daniel from Fiber Home. I'm, I'm not, a, I have not any comment, just a minor suggestion. Because uh, those figures, seems uh, handsome, but it's a little difficult for me to understand. So I suggest maybe we can add some formulas together with some examples or new cases. I of used to be in academia. I don't do formulas suggest. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I could write it beautifully in three formulas, you know, and I could talk to you about banyan trees and banyan tree formulas. Nobody would grok anything whatsoever, you know. I reserved it for the journal paper. <laughs> okay, then just uh, for this. Then the Dhamma from Future Way. So I'm just curious, like you have multiple plans and you have each plan have their um, their own topology. Uh, can you use ISIS different areas to solve the problem? Yeah, like, look, the, it, link inter, the, the plan can be the area, area two and then the... the look, you, you could run in, in the core ISIS, right? right? I mean, we wouldn't have extend rift. You could only shortest path, one hope. So you don't get bisexual bandwidth with ISIs, unless you hack ISIs to the point there's not ISIs anymore. So, but you can use some kind of policy on the side so that you can. Balance ISIs stuff. doesn't have policies. That's why we use BGP. BGP. How, about well, use BGP then? How about use BGP? There's then? a draft. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a draft on that, like um, um, basically have some kind of matrix to influence the path selection. So instead of choosing the shortest path, we add some other weight so that with that other weight added in, maybe the longer path will be chosen. So my comment will be, you know, once your policy grow complicated and long enough, you may start to carry packets by hand and maybe more efficient. Well, well, <laughs> well, yeah, of course, but here we're talking about um, multiple paths and shortest path may not be the best path. And how do we balance yeah, the so, shortest so path? Yeah, so Dima has a draft where he has shown basically with a lot of VPNs how we can solve that stuff. Because, okay. you know, the, the horizon idea is actually Dima's idea, not mine. Because I was standing in front of it like um, sucking my teeth, right? How the hell do you do non-shortest path properly here? And it was Dima's idea that we can actually build a horizon. Because he built the horizon using VPNs in BGP. Because that's how you use them, right? They basically reflect the horizon. That's the BGP mechanism. Okay, so if we have uh, some ideas on how do we do this. Oh, we know exactly how to do this with BGP. That was presented yeah, last. It was presented. Rapid oh, you know, working okay. group, Rift, yeah. We talked about the BGP stuff, right? Okay. Modular okay. little details like where are the couple of hundred lines of BGP policy and how you stitch that stuff properly so it doesn't break. Um, plus, of course, the BGP, you stitch it with the VPNs and you have to start to think, okay, where are your tunnels? What will happen if this thing, where, because no, the tunnels start to de develop their own 
logic, right? Mm -hmm. How to go from one place to another. You have to control them that you go the path that you want. Yeah, but it's all doable. Like I say, okay. now, ultimately, you can get you know, enough people to carry packets by hand and you know, beating them enough, you will get what you want. Uh, so so there's this... another level of complications when you start doing overlay, which is mandatory if you do multi-tenancy, right? So if you do it on the switch, think about VXLAN and VPN, which is one common way to do today. You're going to build structures that is underlay VPN, another VPN that is tenant aware, right? It becomes really complex for management. Well, it may not be VPN per se, but anyway, I'll just mm, throw some I mean, ideas here. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's solvable. I mean, this is trying to solve it in a very ZTP way without with with a very cheap forwarding plane that was always Rift, right? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Any questions, tomatoes? Hey, Sandy. Sandy Donnelly, I'd like to know, uh, make sure if I understand right, uh, how do the uh, top nodes know if the flow is intra-fabric or inter-fabric? Fabric AD. Yeah. Right, and that's a very justified question. That's where Rift saves our bacon, and that's where your BGP will have a hard time, right? Mm -hmm we know the direction of the fabric. So we know who is south and who is north, right? And the north, now we can differentiate whether it's interfabric or whether it's a horizontal link. So mm -hmm. the, inter the link, the adjacency, will clearly tell you which horizon it's on. Yes, I think the FIB, uh, the forwarding table in yeah. the top will show that if the uh, root is from interfabric or intrafabric, Packard, yeah. so yeah. when when the yeah. top receives the flow, they will know how to uh, forward. Correct. This. Which FIB to throw yeah. it to? That's precisely. Okay. And and thanks to ZT because I threw out you know this. That's what we spend a lot of time on hackathon, right? To start to ask questions because I only draw a very simple like you know a three thingy and a four thingy. And they go like, yeah, but I want to wear five. And I wasn't sure, so I had to draw the figure actually, you know, to figure out this presentation um, because I oversimplified. With three, everything works, right? It's kind of trivial. Uh, yeah, but this is ex exactly how it works. The incoming interface will tell you which fit to go to. And yeah. I was slightly skeptical with demand and I looked and yes, all, even the cheapest silicon these days can do that because it's actually a very common problem if you run any kind of VRF, right? You have to know this is a VRF link, so it's a completely different fit. Otherwise yes, it won't yes. work. So I think maybe some flag may be added in the uh, forwarding table uh, for distinguish it. No. No, no, maybe need it. How you yeah. solve it is over specification, right? This thing mm -hmm. tells you, look, this is the computation that you used to build this fit, this is the computation you used to use this fit, yeah. right? So in BGP, it's configurational logic. You have two different uh, yeah. virtual routers yeah. to treat fabric and uh, interfabric routes. Here, based on the fabric ID, you see it's yeah. you, it's not you. Yes, right. yeah, yes, yes. I so see. it's uh, built into protocol. You don't need additional management task to identify a particular interface. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, please look over the stuff. Maybe you'll find a hole. Maybe the whole thing is just made up, I don't know, on scent. Uh, I'm pretty confident, you know, that this stuff holds up, but who knows? It's never seen that done before. I never saw any kind of dynamic routing for Dragonflies, actually, where anybody explained how the hell it's supposed to work, right? All this fancy stuff like Dragonfly or Hypercubes or um, or toroidal meshes were used in supercomputers where links never fail, right? So it's like simple. Dynamic routing is overvalued. And this is, you know, first time I see something cooked up, except Dimas stuff, which is basically, you know, stitching BGP magic just so. So it's not really a routing, it's like, yeah, yeah, like arm handling packets the right way by, you know, a lot of, you know, policy magic, which is fine. A lot of people seems to consider the pretty good job security these days. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tony. Great presentation. And uh, again, we've been trying to solve non just pass routing in academia for probably, since routing exists. That's a very good example how it can be done with right protocol, simply and elegant. So, and uh, we are exactly on time. So just 30 minutes from now, we are going to have a AI and DC side meeting, which is going to talk about in more details, workloads, this kind of topology is dedicated to, so really machine learning application. Uh, we kind of figure out how to record it, hopefully. Somewhere in the cloud, yes. 
Thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll see you in Australia. Great stuff. Tony's too freaking smart. We should beat them up at some point in life, right? I feel stupid every time I leave. I'm like, it's intentional, and it's not just you. <laughs> It was really good meeting. It was really good meeting. It was really good meeting. Yes.